Okay, hello again, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about the neuroscience of test taking. And I will basically uh, draw upon some of the previous research we have conducted, as well as some ongoing studies that is now under review or still ongoing. And we'll give you an idea about what I mean by new neuroscience of language testing. I would like to start off by sharing this uh, very interesting quotation with you from this book called Reading in the Brain uh, by uh, Professor Dehan. Uh, and I'm gonna just read it out to you. In the 21st century, the average person still has a better idea of how a car works than the inner functioning of his or her own brain, a curious and shocking state of affairs. What I'm going to immediately conclude from this statement is that, in my opinion, this is the current status uh, in language assessment. We have not been very actively engaged in research uh, which looks into the brain functioning of test takers under test conditions and have not been able to compare them with uh, brain uh, functions under non-test conditions. Uh, that's something that I would like to talk about today. By the way, that's a great book. If anybody is interested to buy it, um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you will feel like me. You, it will worth every single penny or dollar that you spend on it. A wonderful read. Okay, so um, I want to situate my presentation within the current uh, scholarship in the field of language assessment, but with specific focus on uh, quantitative data analysis. The reason is that that's the field that I um, mostly engage in, and, and most of my previous research has been about quantitative data analysis, until a few years ago. Um, so the first quotation I would like to share is uh, from Box and uh, Draper. It's a very famous quotation. Some of you might have already seen it before. All models are wrong, and it refers to those quantitative data uh, analysis models that we use, like Rush model cognitive diagnostic assessment, structural equation modeling, fact analysis, and in the same way, GLM, et cetera. All models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong they have to be to not be useful. And I wanna add on the, uh, another quotation from Robert Mislevy, who is a big name in item response theory research. And it reads like this, IRT uh, characterizations of students and items are clearly simplifications and they say nothing about the processes, and I wanna stress this, the processes by which students answer items. And he goes on to ask this question, what is the nature of person parameters such as theta skill and mu in uh, latent variables models? Where do they reside? And this to me sounds like a $1 million question. Where do these skills that we measure reside? Of course, it might be a very, uh, 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 might sound like a rhetorical question because we know that they reside inside the body of testicles. And, but, but where specifically, of course, the brain, but as, as I will explain later, it's not only the brain that we need to focus on, but also other parts of the physiology of the testic, which will allow us to get a more comprehensive overview of what changes in the body of test taker as they are taking the test. Okay, so with this pr preliminary, brief preliminaries out of the way, I wanna start what I have to offer you here in lieu of uh, data analysis techniques that heavily focus on uh, the output. That's, for example, IRT analysis. Uh, I wanna see if we can capture the process that results in, in the output or the uh, test um, results. And these are some of the studies that I have uh, you know, conducted in the past and I will present some of them. Okay, so the neurophysiology of the test taker uh, uh, relies on the brain, the eyes, facial emotions and physiology itself. Um, and I will explain how these parts of the body are you know, important and why they are important and what kind of contributions they make to our understanding of tests. 
Okay, so the techniques that I use are these, uh, primarily the first two, I should say, because number three and number four are still ongoing. So on top of uh, the, the list is FNES, or functional near infrared spectroscopy, which you will see here right on the left hand right hand side. You know the cap with those kind of uh, spikes on, on the cap. Then eye tracking is right next to it. This is an eye tracker X300. Uh, it's a Toby eye tracker. Uh, this brand of Toby, I should say, is discontinued. Uh, it has been replaced by another new new model which is called Spectrum, but still a very useful one. We have used this before. Facial emotional recognition is right here at the bottom. This is a software package. This is called um, Face Reader. And Face Reader is um, one of the better ones available uh, in, in the market. I mean, it's a commercial software, but you can, you can also use non-commercialized softwares, uh, which are basically uh, you know, free of charge. And finally, GSR, which is galvanic skin response, right here in the left corner, in the right hand corner. This is something that uh, two of my PhD students, Shulian and Ting Ting, are going to use in their study. Shulian has already started using it, and we will see what we can get out of it. Now, let's talk about FNES first. I have a few principles to share with you. Uh, the first one is neurovascular coupling. Uh, neurovascular coupling is represented visually in the picture in the right hand side. Can you see that? Um, so uh, it is defined in this way the mechanism that links the transient neural activity to the subsequent change in cerebral blood flow, which is regulated by both chemical signals and uh, mechanical effects. What it simply means is that a part of the brain, which is uh, any, any region of the brain which is more active as you are carrying out a language or non-language uh, kind of task will become, uh, uh, you know, will we'll need more energy, that's glucose and oxygen, that's the H2 uh, molecule. So the blood starts to flow to that side of the brain which is more active and it carries oxygen, O2, and of course, glucose, but what FNES does is to identify those areas which have got more oxygen than the rest. And how it does is uh, through a, a very important uh, protein that everybody has, which is called hemoglobin or HB for short. It's right in the uh, upper right corner, if you can see that. It's a visual representation, a schematic, I should say, schematic representation of the. Uh, molecule. So this molecule uh, binds itself to uh, a, uh, O2 and then carries it to the area which is activated during the task. Uh, there's another principle, actually two more principles that we need to go through before I start talking about the studies. One of them has to do with the color of blood. Of course you might say that well the blood is red, that's true, um, and the other one is photon banana. That's a cool name. The color of blood. Well, when, when uh, blood gets oxygenated, it gets lighter, as you see in the picture on the left-hand side. When it's deoxygenated, that's when it loses the oxygen, it becomes darker in color. Um, so these two different um, color, blood colors, let's say, can absorb light at different wavelengths. And we have known this for quite quite a few years now, maybe a few decades. So FNES, like the machine that I used, and that's uh, near sport, uses two wavelengths to distinguish the changes in the amount of oxy and deoxy hemoglobin in blood. Now near sport measures the color difference in blood and uh, uses this information to infer the areas that are stimulated, as I mentioned before, for example, if an area subserves comprehension by comparing the amount of light blood versus dark blood, we can find out whether that area is now stimulated. The next uh, concept is also important. It's called photon banana. As you see in the shape in the left-hand corner, 
Um, so it's also known as banana-shaped photon path. As you know, light, including the infrared light, which is used in this technology, is made of um, photons. So photons introduce at the scalp, the scalp, you know, top of the head, pass through uh, most of the tissue and are either scattered or absorbed by the tissue, the brain tissue. Okay, so because a relative, uh, relatively predictable quantity of photons follow a banana-shaped path back to the surface of the skin, these photons can be measured at the scalp using photo detectors. So if every FNES device has two types of uh, uh, I mean, detectors and, and sources. Detectors send the light and sources absorb them. And after that, we analyze the light that has been absorbed to figure out whether uh, that part of the brain was active or not. And this is the setup in a recent study which was published in language testing, as you see the uh, references right here. Uh, this setup uh, is usually used in FNES studies and also eye tracking. In this study, we combine FNES as the person is wearing it and the eye tracker right at the bottom of the uh, uh, monitor. I hope you can see that it's, it's very small. It's like a small bar with three red dots on it, but that represents the eye tracker. So we collect data from both the eye tracker and the FNES at the same time. And that's what we did in that study. By the way, it's free to download. I mean, if any, anyone is interested to download it, just go ahead. And, yeah. Now, the other thing we did, and this is applicable to all the studies we have done uh, is to identify the parts of the brain or the regions of the brain that we want to measure. Well, uh, since we're doing listening comprehension, there are two processes, top down and bottom up, which we need to take into account when we are doing, uh, you know, test development and assessment. So uh, as a result, we were looking for those regions that were associated with top down and bottom up processing. Uh, we looked at the previous literature and, and uh, finalized this model. Uh, in the papers that I mentioned before, we have explained it in more detail, so I don't go through too much detail here. Uh, long story short, dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is one of the regions. It's right here. So like on, on your you know, forehead, slightly above your forehead, the, le the left one, because the left one is associated with language. Inferior frontal gyrus. It's you know, to the left side of your head, near your ears, and posterior middle temporal gyrus, perhaps around here, above your ear, somehow to the back slightly. Yeah, that's these three regions. The, the first region is associated with top down, and the, the last two regions are associated with bottom up process. So we wanted to measure activity in these regions and figure out whether. Uh, the activity changes across different tasks. And here is some part of the, you know, mathematical analysis that you have to do on the absorbed light, uh, which is detected by the uh, detectors, and figure out whether there is a difference between the two tasks or not. Here at the bottom, you see the, the bigger chart, or the bigger uh, graph indicates um, oxygen, uh, hemoglobin, the amount of uh, hemoglobin oxygenated in one task as, as the person was doing one task. And the one right at the bottom here, the other red one, indicates the same thing, but when the person was doing another task. So it's obvious that uh, there was a different amount of oxygenated hemoglobin as the person was doing two different listening tasks. So this indicates that the two listening tasks are probably engaging the person in different ways. And what that means has to be interpreted with reference to the theoretical framework that you have. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, most of the research I've conducted is about while listening performance and post listening performance tests. And while listening performance tests, <clears throat> you have probably taken this or maybe IELTS. IELTS is a while listening performance test in which you have a pre-listening stage 
uh, in which you are given some time to, to uh, read the questions, then while listening stage starts, during which you are supposed to read the uh, items again, answer them and simultaneously listen to the passage. And that's why we call it while listening performance, performance referring to your answers. And then you might have a post-listening stage. In some tests, you may not have it. In which you can look at your answers again and check if you have done it correctly, as opposed to post-listening performance tests, like the TOEFL test, if you have taken the TOEFL, in which you're uh, not provided with the questions at all. And what you have to do is to listen first, and you're encouraged to take notes so you can take notes. But once everything is done, then questions will appear on the screen if you're taking a computerized test, following which uh, you can answer the questions and you can go back and forth between your notes, the screen, notes, screen, in order to be able to answer the questions, thus the term post-listening performance. So you can, you can see that at least physiologically, there are two different processes here. Okay, so now my studies. <laughs> I provide only a very brief overview of the studies. And let's remember all of the principles that I mentioned before and WLPPLP sort of differences. And I'm going to just walk you through uh, these slides. So the first neuroimaging study was done or was published, one of the first ones, I should say, in 2020, in which we compared listening under two conditions, listening to lectures and listening to natural sounds. What we wanted to do is to revisit the concept of divergent and discriminant validity. And uh, well, that refers to, uh, you know, the concept that when you're listening to something that's uh, similar to academic lectures, so let's say the two stimuli that are similar, um, your brain waves should uh, actually converge or should be very similar to each other. If you are listening to two different things though, here one of them is natural sounds, well then your brain waves should be quite different from each other. And in other words, uh, we refer to that as discriminant validity. We have revised this concept a little bit. Um, you know, those of you who are familiar with these two concepts probably immediately remembered Campbell and Fisk's seminal paper, which was published in 1959, which is still a very important paper in psychology and language assessment research, mostly in psychology. So if you'd like to talk about it more, I'm very happy to you know, give you some ideas about how we defined uh, discriminant and divergent validity uh, under this condition. I mean, in the question and answer time. Okay, so, what we found was that listening to lecture activated inferior frontal gyrus, yeah. And posterior middle temporal gyrus, that's the back, as I mentioned before, significantly more. So there seems to be a more uh, top-down processing, sorry, bottom-up processing when you are listening to lectures. And th those areas are specific to language. So it's not surprising to see that the areas that are specific to language light up when you're doing language tasks. It means that people are really doing language tasks. I mean, they're not daydreaming or something, they're really listening. Okay, so um, we also did some follow-up analysis and we found out that there was some gender effect on test scores, but interestingly, there was no gender effect on the brain regions. And that was quite interesting for us. And we, we were not able to follow find out why there is difference in brain regions. Uh, there's no difference in brain regions in terms of their activation across the two tasks, but there is a brain, uh, they, there is a difference between uh, genders in terms of their scores. So we did follow up studies to figure out what might have caused this difference. Well, we're still not sure to be honest with you, but we have taken some steps. In another study, which was published in Cal, Computer Assisted Language Learning, in this study, we identified that there was uh, a, a test method effect and also a gender effect again. Uh, 
First of all, we ran Roche analysis. Those of you who are familiar with quantitative data analysis, so Roche modeling was done first. But what we found was the group, in terms of their scores, were homogeneous. There was only one group there. And there was no significant differences in test scores across test methods or gender. This result is somehow opposite the previous results. Um, but interestingly, there were significantly different <coughs> activations in the brain regions across test methods, uh, gender, and listening abilities. So what these two studies actually show us is what test scores show is not always in line with what the brain is doing. There is a discrepancy there. And this inconsistency is worth further investigation. It's not just in one region, it's in all three uh, regions that were investigated, uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, IFG, and PMTG. Okay, and the next uh, slide here is just to showcase, uh, you know, a uh, kind of photo, kind of graph of a stimulated brain uh, by test one. You see, is is the same participant who was doing test one in the previous study that I showed you. And all parts of the brain uh, have lit up, as you can have, uh, very clearly see on the left-hand side. But the same person is doing test two. And these two tests are supposedly of the same difficulty level. And they are testing the same thing. But the brain is, well, different in terms of their activation and functionality. And well, they're bottom up and top down press. And I have two videos here. I hope I can play it for you. You can see that this is uh, how the brain activation is captured and basically kind of cartoon of the brain in action under two test conditions. Let me see if I can play them simultaneously or not. Okay, good. Blue means less activity. Warm colors mean more activity. Yeah, once again, it's a very short one. Okay, good. Now next, gaze behaviors uh, have also been a focus of research in my previous investigations. And as you know, we measure gaze behaviors by using eye trackers. And this is one of the first studies that we conducted. Uh, so in this study, what we did was we were, because this test was administered to L1 and L2 speakers, English as L1 versus English as, tools, L, uh, L, uh, English as L2 speakers. So what happened was uh, we found that gaze behavior measures uh, we're able to predict test performance for L2 people, but not for L1 people. What does that mean exactly? Um, the conclusions are a few, and I'm just gonna touch on the most significant conclusions here. It means that there was higher visit duration on test items um, for L2 people meaning that L2 people relied primarily on reading the test items in order to be answered the test items correctly, whereas L1 people didn't show that uh, degree of reliance on their reading skills. So in other words, we might argue that we are looking at something like uh, some degree of construct irrelevant variance. Why? Because for one group, the test um, demands a different sort of processing in which primarily L2 speakers, should focus on written words in order to be able to answer questions correctly, whereas L1 readers didn't have that amount of difficulty, didn't struggle to read. Uh, so they were not lagging as they were reading the, the items. They were reading them very fast. But the problem is that this is a norm reference test. This is a high stakes test, which is used for uh, candidates to uh, to monitor the uh, language ability of candidates who apply to tertiary education, especially in North America. So the, and everyone, even L1 speakers are required to take this because it's also used for uh, immigration purposes. 
So everyone has to take this test, but you're comparing two groups of people with two different uh, cognitive processes. One of them relies on their reading uh, proficiency more than the other group, or one of them struggles to read the item more than the other group does. So here we might put a question mark against the cognitive validity of the test. When we conducted this study, it was perhaps the first study, and now I can hedge this to say it was one of the first studies that showed reading, the process of reading itself has a significant influence on test performance, but for a particular group of people. So when we are measuring listening comprehension, we need to remember that we're not only engaging listening, we're engaging a bunch of other processes that unfortunately are not represented in the test scores, but they are there in the processes through which uh, test takers answered the test items. So we should look at the test scores as something not pure, but uh, something tainted or confounded, if you will, by sources of construct irrelevant variance. The fourth study is the most recent study we published in language testing. It took us quite some time to uh, convince the, re the reviewers, although I should say that they were very supportive, it took us some time to convince them that this study makes sense because it's the first study in language testing that merges FNES and gaze behavior analysis. Uh, sorry for the typo there. Uh, I was, to be honest with you, I was making uh, revisions on the cab when I was uh, driving here. So there was, there was a bump, it was a bumpy ride. So uh, apologies for uh, the typos there. Anyway, so in this study, um, I don't wanna go through every details here. So I present it only in one slide, but in this study, we again compared WLP and PLP. What we found overall is that there was lower activity levels across brain regions uh, that support comprehension during WLP. And also the gaze behaviors in WLP suggested that there was some uh, process which we call keyword matching and shallow listening during WLP. And uh, WLP tests uh, imposed as a result lower cognitive load on the test takers than the PLP test. What this is, um, this runs contrary to the, the results of most of the previous studies, especially the studies done by John Field, in which he claims that uh, WLP imposes a higher cognitive load uh, through different methods other than uh, eye tracking and brain imaging. But what we found here was actually at least our data shows us in a large sample of 80 people that WLP seems to impose less cognitive load than PLP. Now, for more information, I suggest you take a look at the paper, which I said, as I said before, is free to download. Now, the fourth, fifth study was already presented by Rita yesterday. So she wanted to look into, again, test method one, WLP versus PLP. Uh, it's the same data, but she added in uh, uh, metacognitive strategy indices as well. And she found that, uh, again, PLP and WLP are predicted by very different processes. For example, PLP, as we expected, uh, is predicted by gaze behaviors, brain activation in the three regions that I mentioned before and only two metacognitive strategies, whereas WLP uh, is not predicted by brain activation, meaning that PL PLP seems to activate the brain significantly more than WLP. And we took that as the amount of uh, cognitive load, which is higher in PLP versus WLP. Overall, we're convinced that these two processes are different. So, so we, we do not seem to be agreeable uh, with the claim that a test like IELTS and the TOEFL listening test can be equitable and you can convert the scores from the, the TOEFL to IELTS. Although statistically it's done and it can be done, uh, we believe that the processes that lead to test scores 
are quite different across the two tests. And if you really want to equate the two tests, we need to take the, those processes into account and do not only rely on the end results. Now, why does it matter? Um, because um, in a lot of universities around the world, they say we accept IELTS, for example, seven, which is equal to TOEFL, for example, 100 and so on and so forth. But this equality, at least in the listening section of the two tests, we are raising a question mark against it. And we think that this equity or equality, if you will, uh, is not really supported by data, at least from our vantage point. Now, one of my students, Esther, has done a wonderful study in which she tried to uh, equate two tests. Now, test equating, as I mentioned, is a statistical process. Statistically, we found evidence for similarities of the two tests, but it seems that the processes of gaze and brain are telling us a slightly different story. So we are proposing a new approach and the study is under uh, review now. Um, uh, we're, we're proposing a new approach to test equating, which relies on test process, processes and mechanisms. Now, I also have a few slides to talk about emotions, but since I'm running out of time, I quickly just want to mention that as we are using language, we go through a kind of emotional roller coaster. And most often, we're not even aware of that. That's why we differentiate, uh, psychologists differentiate between emotions and feelings. I'm not very much sure if this uh, differentiation has been made in applied linguistics or not. Uh, but from what I understand, emotions have been defined as neurophysiological reactions unleashed by an external or internal stimulus about which we're mostly unaware and we don't have any knowledge. We're suddenly uh, motivated or we're suddenly uh, stimulated by something. But feelings are self-perceptions or specific emotions that are subjective. Um, and subjective expressions are emotions. For example, um, when you, um, to just, you know, to, what, to give you an example to clarify, when you feel anxious, what you feel, what you, what you feel, uh, what you're aware of and conscious about is the feeling. But the emotion is basically that physiological mechanism that's going on inside your body and you're not aware of that. So we can differentiate these two and sometimes they, they are consistent with each other and sometimes there is no match between them. And I think since um, at least feelings or what we refer to as uh, affective schemata uh, have been investigated a little bit in applied linguistics and language assessment, it's worth thinking about differentiating between emotions and feelings, and as a result, try to measure them in different ways. Feelings can be measured subjectively using questionnaires. That's mostly what people do, in my opinion, in applied linguistics, they give questionnaires about anxiety, etc. But it's worth looking into emotions as, as well, which are not uh, um, measurable using questionnaires. So we need to use some technologies in order to find out how people uh, feel at the emotional level when you're, they are stimulated. So um, one of the studies that is under review right now is, is done by uh, my student, Joey, who used facial emotional analysis uh, using a face reader. What she found in the end was that test takers, yeah, I hear the bell, uh, test takers perform better when the stimuli embedded happy rather than sad sentiments uh, but this was not statistically significant, but there was, a, there was a difference between them, but unfortunately it didn't reach significance. And finally, test takers exposed uh, to video and audio stimuli performed better, this was significant, uh, than when audio stimuli were used in the test. So it has its own implication. Uh, Vahid, do, do I still have time to go ahead? Yes, dear. Yeah. yeah, you have five minutes. Okay, nice. Yeah, fine. So, nice. So uh, facial uh, emotional analysis is one way of measuring emotions because it measures four, uh, six basic emotions. And, and these basic emotions have been around at least since Darwin's time. He proposed that there are six emotions that are common between humans and our closest cousins, 
uh, apes, specifically chimpanzees. Because by looking at the facial expressions of people and probably to a lower extent in apes, you can find out how they're probably feeling. For example, when they are smiling, it's most likely they're happy, depending on how they smile, of course. Sometimes smile is sarc indicates sarcasm. I understand that. But uh, when they're unhappy, for example, when they're sad, you can read it from their face. When they're uh, angry, you can read it from their face. When they're surprised, you know, and so on. As I mentioned yesterday in the conversation with a few of the colleagues online, uh, you can you can see five of these emotions in the cartoon Inside Out. What is not um, present there is uh, surprise. One of my friends actually mentioned it to me last night. Surprise is not present there. But these five basic emotions can predict a part of our behavior. So it's, it's a good idea to do some research on them and see how they could, uh, how they would interact with stimuli and uh, how they might affect the test taker's performance. And last but not least is a GSR or galvanic skin response. I'm not gonna go through this, but I'm just saying that this is another technology and looks like this uh, figure here. Actually, I have one of them here in my office is in the, in the locker. I didn't have, I didn't find time to bring it out, but it's pretty easy. Uh, Shulian is using it and hopefully in the following conference of Malik, whenever it will be, Shulian will present the results of her study. And perhaps Ting Ting will have uh, also finished her study of using it. And both of them will present something to you. But GSR uh, is another technology that allows us to measure uh, emotions in a relatively objective way. So what I have been discussing so far brings me to this point. I'm convinced that test takers are persons, not merely cognitive processes. I'm saying this because most of the literature in, in, in uh, language assess, in listening assessment uh, is revolving around cognitive processes, cognitive processes of test takers and the validation of cognitive processes. But what I'm proposing is that if you wanna validate a test or if you wanna develop a test, okay, cognitive processes are important, but we should not lose the sight of the fact that humans are a lot more than cognition. We have emotions, we have motivation, we have neurophysiological processes. And these different pieces of jigsaw puzzle uh, that we're, we're creating should be put together. So the image that will emerge will be more comprehensive. Uh, some, uh, these paragraphs are from uh, Rita's presentation yesterday, but I'm gonna quickly read it because they are still relevant. Uh, from here, previous frameworks on construct validity, such as nomothetic span and the non-logical network, we can talk about these, by the way, if you are not very sure what they are, consider construct validity within the network of relationships between a test measurement and other factors. Uh, what we are proposing here is the concept of cognitive validity rather than construct validity. And it actually also we can you know, argue that it, it rests upon the same principle, a network of relationships. So it's, it refers to the converging evidence that different test methods measuring the same construct should engage test takers in the same neurocognitive processes, resulting in the same test taker behavior represented by test scores. Uh, I hope this definition is clear. And finally, uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Sumita, uh, I, might, I, might, I hope I, I said her name correctly, uh, presented a wonderful plenary speech, uh, which I really liked it because one of the topics that I'm interested in is the effect of social and environmental factors on test takers and students. So I believe that if anyone who investigates neurocognitive validity in the future should contextualize validity, should consider social and environmental factors, especially the effect of social equity environmental justice, environmental racism, even the effect of pollutants and neurotoxins and so on and so forth on test takers. And this might be surprising, uh, you know, 
to some people because how could pollutants and neurotoxins affect test scores? But there is a lot of research outside of the field of language assessment that shows that there's a connection between our environments, our brain, and our academic performance. And language assessment is, of course, no exception. We also need to take into account the effect of SES, motivation, and other factors that have to do with our environments and also uh, our neurophysiological uh, attributes. I have created a video recently, and it's up there. I think Bahid was uh, probably playing that video. Uh, in that video, I have explained how environments, pollutants, toxins, etc., can affect the brain and how the brain affects uh, uh, our te test performance. So it's the interplay between these, so these social and environmental factors and the brain uh, as well as test performance, which is important and which should be taken into account in any validation attempt. Uh, finally, variance in test scores or exam grades is not only due to the cognitive and neurological process, but certainly due to environmental factors as well, because no matter what we do, we can explain, if we're very, very lucky, we can ex explain only up to around 40% of the variance in test scores by referring to the neurophysiological processes of test takers. The rest is not explained. And I believe we should do some research, some rigorous research. I haven't seen any research about this um, that takes into account social and environmental factors as well and uh, factors them into the equation. And I would like to thank these people, organizations and companies that provided a lot of help since 2016 without whose support and help, it would have been certainly impossible to, uh, to, to do these studies and uh, you know, publish those papers and so on. Okay, that brings me to the end of this presentation. Before I finish, I should say that I wasn't at my best. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, well, I, I'm feeling fine, but I wasn't at my best, but I hope that uh, what I presented made sense <laughs> and you found it interesting. Now I'm open to any questions or suggestions, especially. Over right, to you. Ahead. Yeah, it certainly did. We enjoyed your presentation. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank Despite you. your illness, hopefully you will get completely better. <laughs>